I'm Luke Story. For the past 22 years, I've been relentlessly committed to my deepest passion, designing the ultimate lifestyle based on the most powerful principles of spirituality, health, psychology, and personal development. The Lifestylist Podcast is a show dedicated to sharing my discoveries and the experts behind them with you. So um, you've been on the show a couple times before. One of my favorite guests, you're like, anytime I talk to you, you're a wealth of enthusiasm, information. You're someone who's constantly researching, constantly working on yourself, building your company. You're a very dynamic dude. And that's one thing that I really enjoy about you. So let's start off. Speaking of dynamics, what is new in the world of True Kava? What do you guys have going on in development of products and things you're learning about Kava, how you're uh, really pioneering the industry of this amazing plant medicine? Yeah, we've got we've got so many things in the works right now, and just you know, right now the landscape is, uh, you know, even though it's been a really um, challenging time, obviously, like everybody knows, in the last year, two years, three years here, um, it's it you know, the Chinese have a word, and I don't remember the word, but they do have a word <laughs> that means both danger and opportunity, right? Risk and opportunity would be more specific, and like right, I think that we're at that juncture right now. And I think that uh, because we've had so much pressure put on us, both physiologically, environmentally, psychologically, emotionally, collectively, it really has created a lot of opportunity for personal growth and a lot of opportunity to, to have our weaknesses exposed, right? And a lot of opportunity to kind of figure out what is it that we really need? What is it that we really need as a culture? What is it that we really need for community? Uh, what do we really need um, individually too? Uh, and so, you know, because of that, like it's definitely given us some clarity. We, it's like we had a lot of different avenues on the table, specifically with True Kava and some of the other projects that we're involved in of like, OK, we can go here and here and here and here and here. But, you know, for me, um, especially after the things that I've been through in my life, I, I mean, obviously the past two years, but going back even further than that, like we passed, we, we talked on past episodes about a little bit about my story. And um, actually, you know, COVID was kind of like another another day of trauma for me that actually wasn't all that bad because, you know, I spent all of my twenties in absolute, almost indescribable, just daily hell, uh, you know, trying to just scour to survive in any way that I possibly could, you know, and, uh, you know, ultimately what allowed me to do that was just learning, uh, you know, different forms, ways, strategies to, you know, sort of seek self-empowerment through knowledge. Um, and, you know, being able to then ascertain a vision out of that knowledge and then create a plan out of that vision and then execute that plan. Uh, and that's been a long process of understanding that and learning that, especially from where I started from. Um, so, you know, with True Kava, we've been working on a lot of stuff, right? You know, so we talked about, you know, on, on the past couple episodes, just kind of like what Kava is you know, it's basic applications, the basic science around it, you know, how I discovered it, how I came across it, you know, how is what we're doing any different than anybody else? Or, you know, for most people, they're just hearing of Kava, you know, for the first time on those episodes or even maybe now, uh, because it really is in this wheelhouse of, um, of very relevant psychoactive plant medicines, right? That right now, and we had, had talked about this before too as well, like I, I see this time that we're in right now as kind of a renaissance period. Um, but just you know, specifically a subcategory to that is that we're in the middle of a plant renaissance, a medicinal plant renaissance, right? Where, where, which is part of sort of a renaissance, you know, you know, rediscovery of a, of a nature reintegration process because the pressure that's being put on us is forcing us to sort of introspectively look inside and sort of get reconnected with our existential core and the source from where we came from, which is the collective intelligence of nature, or we'll perish, basically, right? Literally, like we're falling apart from disease. We're falling apart psychologically, emotionally. And, you know, nature is solace and nature is, is uh, sanity, in my opinion. So, um, so, so basically, uh, where we kind of, you know, go from here in the conversation is, uh, you know, we, uh, there's, there's many aspects that, you know, that we can expand on from, like you said, like the addiction aspect of it. Because the addiction aspect is probably the most relevant to like what kava contributes to the overall, you know, you know sort of plethora of, of compounds um, and strategies that are available. 
Um, but there's also a, a broader conversation about plant medicine in general. More, most specifically, of course, we've got you know all the physiologic you know plant medicines that are being rediscovered that are available in health food stores and supermarkets and things more and more. Um, but you know more specifically, the psychoactive and more specifically the psychedelic plant medicines. Any of the plant medicines that affect and have the potential to expand and optimize consciousness by creating a, a more all-encompassing, complex reintegration of the duality of the brain, the left and right hemispheres that we tend to, under states of trauma, retreat farther into one side or the other, which is why everything in our split groups is split right down the middle. And usually that's predicated by the side of the cortex, the side of our consciousness that is either practical or rational or introspective creative. That oh, that's, be... I never thought about that. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. So thinking about politically the left and right yes, paradigm. Exactly. That's yeah. so interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. Which is literally just like an external manifestation of, of right. that, right? Whenever but, you know, it's kind of inverse though, right? Because you have kind of people that would classify uh, as more right, which would really be more left-centered brain, like relying on logic and facts versus the classical left, which would be more about, you know, emotional feeling things and making decisions based on that. It's interesting. Right. Yeah, exactly. I never thought about that. Is that polarity that occurs. And in the political arena, there's, there's because, you know, in times of adversity and pressure, things tend to, people tend to retreat either into opposite sides of their duality, whether it be masculine or feminine, or whether it actually be like, you know, you know, full blown into the more practical or the more um, or the more you know introspective emotional, because it's 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 really the marriage or the integration of these these the duality of nature, the two sides. You know, whether it be the, the light and the darkness, even the idea of integrating the darkness is important, like Jungian principle, right? The idea of integrating the masculine and the feminine, right? Uh, because we're all masculine and feminine, we we have that, even though. You and I, our bodies are masculine, right? We're, you know, um, we're males, but we still have that feminine side to us. And it's, it's well known to, um, uh, you know, by psychotherapists and people who study human psychology uh, that, uh, you know, men under trauma tend to retreat into their opposite side, they, you know, in, in order to gain introspection. You know, uh, it's it's kind of a defense mechanism because they tend to be more on the other side. And there's there's a there's a tendency for humans to retreat into their opposite. And, you know, women tend under trauma tend, not all the time, there's all kinds of exceptions to this, especially because, you know, masculine and feminine can occur in any body and all this stuff. But there's, they tend to retreat more into their masculine side to defend themselves, right? You know, um, you know, it's, it's basically type that, that more of that aggressive side, right? More of that executive side. But, you know, either way, it's just basically, it's a retreating, you know, aspect. that's like the fight or flight. So you're kind of retreating into something that you're not currently inhabiting. But that happens in the left-right paradigm is like as far as like as broad scale as actually like the brain and consciousness itself, like the two sides of the physical brain that helps, you know, transceive, I guess you would say, you know, from from, you know, you know the principle of of, I guess, more of the morphic resonance principle, I guess you'd say uh, uh, that, 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 you know, picks up and transceives consciousness and then, you know, creates that type of um, your your perceptual experience in this body, in this life. Um, but at the end of the day, the combination of both sides of duality at whatever layer, whether it's the all encompassing layer of like light and dark, right, which would be like truth illusion all the way down into its more intricate sort of subcategories, which would be all the way down into like the human experience of like, you know, the physical brain, that left right thing. Right. But really, it all comes down to duality. But I think where I was going with that is I, I think that an incredibly important aspect to growing as an individual is finding some combination of strategies, um, practices, circumstances, connections, relationships uh, that can help you create more to pull the, the duality together and integrate the two sides of your consciousness at every level to the greatest degree that you can, right? Because, you know, for example, you know, like, you know, the left and the right, you know, people who go left and right. We all know it's like if, if you're someone who's kind of moved more towards the center or that just uh, has gotten to a point in your life where you can look really, truly objectively, like it's hard and, and probably, you know, none of us truly fully can fully be objective because we all have our own biases and we're human. But if you can look f just objectively about, you know, say the two sides of the, of the uh, political sphere, 
um, you know, you know, you can pick and choose, uh, you know, where one side is right and where one side is part right, and that the rational and the creative and the emotional both actually have their place, right? You know, whenever you fuse emotion with rationality and practicality, you get emotional intelligence, right? If you have emotion that's raw and by of itself that comes out from our more primitive side of just the survival fight or flight thing, that's just called emotional reactivity, and that's dangerous, right? So, like, you, whenever people say you need to think more, your mind has to be stronger than your emotions, which is something that a lot of successful people have said. Kobe Bryant used to say that. What I think that he really meant was not that the emotions aren't important. You, your emotions are what make you human. They're incredibly important. But it's the integration of the mind and that the, 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 the emotions should be filtered through the practicality of the mind and integrated so that you can check it against measurable acts, aspects of objective reality. So like, does this emotion make sense? Is it in line with objective reality, right? Because then, because just raw emotion by it of itself is the quickest path to the most delusional behavior that you can imagine, right? That's how dictators take over is they hijack emotions, right? So, you know, through a lot of different means, that's how sociopaths, that's how cult leaders, you know, all, all of this stuff, you know. So anyways, that, that left-right brain sort of, you know, you know, fusion is really important. And so kind of back to how I got started on that was just we're talking about plant medicine, right? And the, the, just, to, you know, giving it some context of why psychedelics uh, or entheogenic compounds, these, these, you know, very specifically comprised organisms, which is what they are, right? Whether they be out of the fungal kingdom, out of the plant kingdom, or even out of the animal kingdom, say with like Bufo, um, they are they are organisms that have developed the the neural network that can produce chemistry that's fully compatible with other aspects of the natural ecology too, which all humans are. That you know that that can be transferred when one ingests that, and it offers. You know, almost like, you know, a connection between two synapses. We talked about last time, you know, we talked about, you know, sort of that that principle of like, you know, do plants, you know, kind of surface at a time of great need because they have an intention to want to. You, you have know? a great memory, and it was, <laughs> by yeah. the way. <laughs> yeah. I need to drink more kava, man. Yeah, like, yeah. how do you remember this shit? Yeah. Then again, to be fair, you only had that one conversation with me and I've probably had a hundred since then. But... <laughs> Dude, that is fair. That's but, I fair. but I love that you're able to catch yeah. those touch points. Yeah. But that was an interesting conversation, I thought, you know, because a lot of people are skeptical of that. And you should be skeptical of everything and, and just have it as a thought exercise if it's not provable. But yeah, you know, you know so we kind of touched on it's like, okay, we'll do plants actually, you know, you know, manifest intentionally at a time where they're needed, right? Like how does that plant know that it needs to be inside you or whatever? Or and, how does ayahuasca make right, its way from right. the jungles of and then we kinda, South America to right Texas, right you know? <laughs> and in, in my perspective was tailoring it back to the base of like the guy in principle that this underpinning intelligence is 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 the baseline of reality that's orchestrating everything and that all these organisms are like extensions of that like apples on a tree right and so just like you know microcosm macrocosm as above so below right just like the human mind like the collective mind of the guy in principle like of, of the planet um, there are a bunch of other individual extensions, units of life called cells, brain cells, right? And whenever one cell is in trouble, the entire system will orchestrate other cells and recruit other cells to be able to go and to give that cell aid to either, you know, break it down and replace it or, which, or, um, or, you know, give it aid and, you know, secrete all kinds of things to allow it to heal. So if you look at the natural ecology as that system, right, and you think of, these plants are just other cells. There, there are there other compounds. There are other living parts of the same mind as a human. That there may be some underpinning intention or intentionality out, out of the um, out of the out of the substrate, the intelligence that that we're really just an extension of. We're not these things that just reign over this thing. We're just the brain cell, right? You know, from my perspective, I mean, that's that's, that's just, you know, of course we can't, you know, but <laughs> thought exercise. <laughs> but um but you know you know from that perspective like like we had talked about last time um i've always found it incredibly fascinating that that you know you know plants could have an intention meaning that the intelligence it's it's really the 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 intelligence of the entire organism that has an intention right you know from that perspective 
So, you know, when it comes to, um, you know, the necessity of some of these plants and, and why, you know, so many kingdoms or so many different kingdoms produce them. And, um, you know, I guess we would have to know a lot more specifically, like we can't, I mean, it can't necessarily fully communicate with the source, you know, that's, I mean, every spiritual practice is trying to do that. But it's everything, right? So it's it's kind of you know, <laughs> so it's not like it's like you can break it down to it's like oh it you know I put this plant here because of this and because of this because of this yeah because there's it's, nothing it's more that, than we can there's comprehend. nothing that's not that right yeah. <laughs> like, yeah exactly yeah I think at one point in my spiritual journey I, mm-hmm. I forget where I heard it or kind of how it started to to come to me as a a solid realization but I I found myself I'm always like out there looking for God right it's like why. Well, yeah. About these practices, so I can be in contact with God, and then at some point it started to evolve into maybe it's not so much looking for God; it's just acknowledging the fact that that's all there is, right? Right. right and yeah. then what are the things in my subjective experience that are blocking me from having that right. realization on a daily basis? It's yeah. like God isn't a thing you need to go out and find. It's like you need to get out of the way, and then right. it's like you get the cloud out of the way of the sun. The sun's always been there. It's not that you need to create the sun or yeah. contact the sun or believe in the sun. There's just some clouds in the way that are obscuring your view, yeah. which would be, I guess, for us, inner peace and fulfillment, uh, if that's what we seek from a spiritual experience. Like it's like it's like it's like you're not just this separate entity that's just been placed on this 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 physical earth or in this existence just this puppet that life pushes around it's like right. that old <laughs> right. that old alan watts quote it's like you know you know the real you is not is not a puppet that life pushes around the real deep down you is the whole universe or that you know you are how did it go you are um you are something that the whole universe is doing in the same way that a wave is something that the whole ocean is doing that that mm-hmm. i loved that metaphor i was I thought that was beautiful when i heard that it's like yeah you know, gosh how much wisdom is in that it's 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 really powerful under that sort of kind of oneness principle that's kind of unanimous throughout all even religions but uh you know spiritual practices of like you know really like we're part of a process that is life right and so any spiritual practice or, or anything that we're trying to do for personal growth is really just trying to dissolve the barriers that we've created that have brought us that 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 have created some perceptual um you know separation from the process of life where we're not synced with it in this human experience or we're synced with it less. And if you can sync yourself with the process of life by acting in a way with your behavior, with your service, with your actions, with your practices, with your job, with your, your care, with your, you know, your, 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 your immediate family or your community, when you do things that actively contribute to objectively making life better. That is part of that dissolving those boundaries, right? Because that's dissolving the illusion that you're something else. You understand that giving is like the the doorway to that whole process. It opens up that that truth principle, that that, that love principle, uh, which is which is which is intimately integrated into that whole oneness principle of like really like you know the idea of this consciousness knowing itself through giving itself away that that entire thing that's that's you know um but you know whenever you do that it's it's like that's what personal development personal growth is all about it's all about aligning yourself with the process of life through all of your actions which that is truly pro life right it's like are you pro in in the real sense right <laughs> you know in the, in the in the real sense of the word are you are you pro life or are you pro illusion or are you pro pro death right um, you know, just trying to, you know, align yourself with that, I think is just, you know, it's just incredibly from just a relative standpoint, you know, it's, it's, it's a, a reference point to have to kind of just understand, right. That, that, um, you know, you know, we're not just these like separate things, these, these victims that walk around, like we are the process of life and it's, it's us that create these boundaries. Uh, and it's our job to dissolve these boundaries and just, and, you know, it's part of the human experience is that we're not perfect, but it's like that's part of what the ride, I, th- I think, you know, that's that's what it certainly feels like yeah. is all about is is is, is discovering is that self-discovery of what's real, what's true and what really is life, which is basically the same thing. What really is life or uh, love, which is the force that governs and harmonizes life. Embracing so, embracing the imperfection, I think the imperfection right, within right. oneself and the imperfection in humanity is is the key to peace, right? Mm-hmm. Because 
if and I've talked about this a lot on the podcast because it's such a huge uh, revelation to me, but let's take like the human experience on earth Mm -hmm. and all of the strife that we see, poverty, suffering, uh, starvation, you know, just all the bad things, right? If we could just fix all those, kind of the do-gooder syndrome, right? Of like, there's something wrong with the world and I know how to change it. And if it was just the way that I believe it should be, then all would be well. But from the perspective of earthly life's purpose for humanity being the evolution of consciousness, planet Earth and our experience is absolutely perfect for that. Right, right. right. Because you have this imperfection and you have a spectrum of consciousness Mm -hmm. in which you can play. You have the free will as an individual soul in a body Mm -hmm. to move up and down this scale of what we might call in duality, you know, good or evil, right? Just to simplify it light, dark, et cetera, however you want to couch it. But it seems to me that if the world was perfect and there was no suffering and no illness and no cruelty, then there would be no necessity for Earth to exist because its entire purpose would be negated by that, right? We'd be living in this angelic realm. And perhaps there are, I believe there are. I've visited them, you know, occasionally, um, angelic realms where there is true oneness and abundant unconditional love and the other side of duality is no longer present perhaps that's one of the places we go when we die or there's other dimensions and realms where there are beings right now that are 100 percent benevolent 100 100 percent of the time but if that was the purpose here it would already be that way yeah. but it's not so maybe in that is like embracing the perfection of it and then each of us taking it upon ourselves if we so choose and we're directed by our higher will to do so to work on our personal evolution because we have the perfect playground to do it. Sort of like if if we lived in utopia, it would be like, you know, sending a postgraduate student to kindergarten, right? It's like, Mm -hmm. well, what would be the purpose? We have to have the bandwidth of experience so that we have some um, malleability and room to change and evolve. Otherwise we would just be all at the highest level (laughs) and we'd all just be here singing Kumbaya and there would be no room for growth. And there would be no perception of the significance, right? And the meaning behind that state of, uh, on that, that, that level of perfection, you know, that level of greatness or, you know, experiencing it. Um, or at, at least, of course, you know, nobody knows exactly, you know, uh, I mean, about any aspects of these conversations, but just, you know, from a, a feeling standpoint. Um, yeah, that's that's beautiful what you said. I mean, it's there's, um, you know, perhaps you know even this place here in, in space and time that we we reside that we call existence in life is just part of, it's it's just resides somewhere in infinity, <laughs> never ending infinite existence. Um, you know, you know, perhaps it's part of a training module. Perhaps it's an inter- it's it's an intermediary in order to instill within us a sense or an understanding or a perceptual experience of significance so that it can be an experience moving to higher levels, moving, you know, dissolving those boundaries and remembering, you know, who you are, you know, or the oneness remembering what itself is, right? Mm-hmm. You know, and, and again, this is, you know, uh, you know, philosophers, you know, greats, Alan Watts, others, you know, always had interesting thought exercises where, he would bring the crowd through and, you know, say things like, you know, imagine that you could be that you, that you could be anything that you wanted to be in existence. Basically, imagine that you were the oneness or you were the base, you know, eventually you would get bored and you would go off and have great experiences that were absolutely perfect. You know, you'd go off on great adventures and you could turn into anything that you want. You could manifest any experience. And eventually that would get a little bit boring because it's too easy. Right. And then you start to go down the ladder and go down the ladder and you have every experience humanly possible. And then eventually you would end up in an experience that is you right now, you know, Um, exactly where you're sitting, you know, no matter how big your trials and tribulations are or anything like that, um, at some higher level of existence, there's a manifestation of, of, uh, you know, the construction of, the, the process of building the 
opportunity for experience. So, so, you know, for something that is infinite, if it was infinite, for it to experience itself, it first has to forget what it is. <laughs> yeah, it has <laughs> you know? to differentiate. And I know that's yeah. a lot of this is probably even over, you know, uh, <laughs> this is, the, you know, this is, this is, you know, pretty intense, uh, you know, conversation, obviously. And, uh, but I mean, you know, anyone who's, who's, who's ever um, engaged in these spiritual practices, religious practices, or read any, you know, philosophical text, I think it's important because these are underpinning themes here, you know. And you know, none of us know for sure, right? Even 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 the wisest people, people the, the you know, great authors and and researchers, scientists, you know, you know, spiritual uh, practices, you know, gurus, etc. Like even the wisest people can't see all ends because that's part of the human experience. That's something that we know for sure is that we don't know. We don't know everything. That's a good place to start. You know, it's a damn good place to start because only only then can you even start to learn anything if you can admit that. Yeah. Right. So like, no matter what experience you have, uh, where you go off into other places or even with plant medicine or anything like that, um, you you, it's just you know you know the deeper that you go and especially if you've been humbled by real life circumstances, nothing will teach you that you know nothing more than like being slapped the hell around like through serious trauma. You can go have a blissful psychedelic experience and come back with a bigger ego, right? You try having a horrific experience or going through 10 years of absolute hell, clawing your way through a horrific disease process or watching a loved one do something. And it's, it's, gonna, it's either going to crush you or it's going to change you for the better, right? You know, um, And so that's that kind of risk opportunity type situation I think kind of we're all in now. But even just to kind of like you know, circle it back a little bit, I, I think it was good that we kind of went there because – you know, you know, a lot of that just is, is, you know, some of it is interesting thought exercise, but a lot of it is just, you know, some of the core principles of just, you know, the pursuit of purpose and meaning and truth and which is our highest aspiration of humans, no matter what way you slice it, no matter what your religion is, no matter what your perspective is, even if you, you know, say that you're atheist or anything like that, we all understand that meaning and purpose are important and that love and community are important. And those are just different ways of kind of trying to pull back the curtain and see, like, where does that stuff come from? We all agree that you know, like, anyone who's not a sociopath agrees that, right? Um, and, you know, so you know, the reason I, I think that's kind of good having a little bit of that conversation because it kind of puts in the context, like, what we're seeking with any of these practices, right? When we talk about, like, psychoactive plant medicines, right? Or, or if we talk about, um, you, know, you know, meditation, deep breathing practices, <coughs> or psychotherapy or any of that stuff, what are we actually seeking? We're seeking a sense of meaning and a sense of purpose in our lives and we're seeking fulfillment, right? Which mainly comes through, I mean, you know, meaning comes through, I think, as Jordan Peterson would say, you know, the, the adoption of responsibility is primarily where meaning comes from. The adoption of responsibility overcoming very difficult things um, which allow you to be able to, to, to build and then maintain the things that really, really give the highest level of meaning, which is going to be connection, uh, you know, you know, human connection, and ultimately connection to your deeper self, and so on and so forth. Yeah, and having some reserves mm -hmm. that are shareable, right? Right. When, when you're depleted spiritually and physically, there's you're inherently stuck in a lower base nature because right survival is the only thing. <laughs> possible and the only yeah. thing that has meaning is like how am i going to get through this hour get through this day get through this month this year etc yeah right but when one's been faced with some adversity and by whatever means you uh, sought to overcome it you did in fact do so i don't know I, I don't know many people that haven't been driven into service as a way of life or at least part of their life um in, in profound ways without having that suffering yeah you know it's like i know so many things and you and i share a past of addiction which we'll get into but as i started to um, be able to overcome that through grace and a lot of surrender and some work uh, i was compelled and incompelled to help people overcome that right it's yeah. like if you run out of a burning building and you found the door that's not burning you're just you have to go show people it's that door door yeah. number three run you know yeah. It's just in, unless again you're a you sociopath, exactly. you're just kind of compelled to share what you've learned through through the adversity that you've experienced and overcome. You feel, um, yes, you feel completely compelled because the experience has 
imprinted itself on you so so deeply whenever something like that happens when when any serious trauma happens and you're not a sociopath which a sociopath would be a human who's just far disconnected and divorced from their existential core enough to where they they're they're they don't have a good signal to their empathy right <laughs> they don't have a good signal or a good connection to their uh to their existential core it doesn't mean that it's not there uh, for my belief anyways um it doesn't mean that it's not there it just means that maybe for now or in this life uh that's just not your karma that's just not you know the, you know your circumstances and your free will and your choices has separate you so far from that but if you're a person a standard person <coughs> you do feel absolutely compelled because you felt that experience of suffering and what that does to you is it pulls that sort of deep more authentic empathetic part of you that part that that feels and it, it, it just and then you, you know afterwards it primes itself to where <coughs> when you see others hurting you hurt you you're not it 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 dissolves your ego and your ego is that thing that creates perceptual separation when that's dissolved, you just automatically feel people's pain more, you know, which is a natural thing. It's not something that you have to develop. It's in you. It's just those barriers get dissolved and you find it. And so that's why people, you know, we've talked about before, I think, the, you know, the two paths to growth, right? It's like there's the, the desperation path, which we've been talking about, right? Forced into a corner. And that's powerful because that locks into, you know, you know, your primitive system, your fight or flight system, your DNA, it's in you. It's that survival mechanism. Um, and then there's the inspiration path, right? The inspiration path is like seeing something that someone else went through or your own process and shifting out of the desperation and then just being truly inspired. I honestly think a lot of people would tell you desperation is more powerful. Like you need to like be um, insecure and angry or um, – or you know you know hungry in that regard to be successful or to be aggressive there's there's aggressive is a, a dual-sided coin uh you know too you can there's a good side and there's a bad side there's a good type of aggression i think inspiration can be more powerful if it's someone who's been through especially people who have been through the desperation and then have had their inspiration like they're not in the desperation anymore um and and they can build it teaches them how to build a life that they can avoid that desperation or overcome that desperation and which awakens many times an inspiration and that locks you into something that is innate inside you that I believe is connected to your existential core and your real power like what you really are that's so good dude I've never heard it articulated that way and it it sparked something in me thinking about um, the early days of of my own uh, recovery from addiction and coming to the realization that seeking a relationship with a higher power and uh, living truly a spiritual way of life, however difficult that was in the beginning. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. But I was doing that because I had to, mm -hmm. not because I wanted to. Right. And then over the course of some years, as I started to kind of gain my footing a bit, then I never thought of it in this way until you, until you stated it that way. But then the desperation did evolve into inspiration where it's not I'm doing the things that I'm doing, say prayer, meditation, helping other people because I have to because I'm going to die if I don't do it. But it's like, well, what else is there to do? Of course, that I'm com I'm compelled to do yeah. it. I'm inspired to do it. It's just there's no other way to live. There's nothing else that gives life uh, meaning. But I'm not I'm not. I'm not praying or reading a spiritual book or going to a retreat or doing plant medicines because like, I'm afraid to die. I'm doing it because I want a more rich and um, broad experience. Yeah. I just, it's that inspiration from within myself. That's like, keep going, keep going. You're making progress. Not because I have to, but because I want to. And when you think about it, it's a beautiful process because, because desperation is, is such an opportunity, right? It's like that risk opportunity. Like I, I like I was saying, I, I believe we're in now culturally, I uh, it's 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 such an opportunity in that way because desperation is is usually all about self-preservation, right? Especially in a, like a disease process or something. And that has its purpose. It's it's kind of like, you know, th those dark times, the your desperation is part of darkness, a dark experience. But it has its purpose because it teaches you how to be inspired, right? Because like you know, it's like freedom, you know? Only people that are truly deprived of it have the slightest inclination as to what it is. And we're starting to experience a little bit of that in the last couple of years here that 
we live in this bubble in this part of the world that most of us going back you know decades have never even tasted we've never tasted any form of you know of of real control or or um enslavement or uh you know we've been able to walk out of our houses for the most part not worried about being you know brutally killed by you know someone in our government just coming by and saying i'm going to execute you today or or i could get to tell you what to do where to work how to how to how to think how to feel how to speak how to, all these kind of things we we've tasted a little bit of that and i think that i i'm optimistic about where it goes but we we definitely have have dipped a little bit into into some darkness that i think has catalyzed some inspiration in at least a percentage of people so you know desperation is a catalyst it can be a catalyst. it's an opportunity it's an opportune catalyst right uh you know for inspiration but it's a beautiful thing because that it's like we're talking about the purpose of darkness, right? Of like why you need darkness is just like, you know, in order to have that experience, in order to be able to 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 dissolve those barriers, to to remember who you really are, and to find your true power, right? The the truth inside of you, the truth that resonates inside of all of us, that that's that that core that in most spiritual practices we believe is unconditional love. You don't just summon it by saying hey you know like you know like you it's like trying to let go of your ego with your ego you know <laughs> things have to happen right um in order for it to in, in order for you to connect and sort of you know come off of yourself because we live through our egos most of the time but anyways it's it's like that process of like desperation to inspiration it's just such a such a beautiful one because the you know, you, you know the darkness gives that opportunity to kind of dissolve those barriers and it cuts it cuts it down almost like you know the pressure makes diamonds thing you know where it just sort of squeezes that real juice out of you like you're pressing a seed or something and then it's there and once it's there you know it's kind of like that saying like the truth is like a lion you don't have to defend it it, it, it defends itself or whatever there's a part in every person that just whenever you become truly inspired you don't have to fully push yourself all the time anymore like when you're in desperation, you're constantly having to kind of find ways to like motivate yourself, right? So whenever you find a way to push yourself, that's good because at times you need to do that. But whenever you align yourself with something that's real, something that you're meant for, something that you're made for, and it's pulling you, you have a whole new level of power, right? Real power, right? Um, you know, because then you, you're not constantly having to motivate. You, you're being pulled by something. Uh, I've, I've, I've actually heard... You know, Tony Robbins alludes to that before too, when he's he's you know he was, he was sort of discussing his trajectory and his process of sort of aligning himself with what he was made for. And obviously, everybody knows the guy is like an absolute machine because the guy is like aligned himself absolutely with it, with some level of like synchronicity and throughout his experiences and just being with those things and and uh, it just or people like him, right? That have just done, been able to do so many seemingly impossible things and reach so many people. Like that's that power is inside of all people. You know, and some people never find it in this life, in individual lives, and maybe there's a higher purpose to that too within the entire organism. You know, yeah. And 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 I'm always, I would say that there certainly is, right? There's some sort of you know darkness, you know, um, you know opportunity or principle for the collective in some way from everything that happens. You know, I'm kind of at the point in my life where I I don't believe in bad experiences. I believe in painful experiences, right? Some experiences are incredibly, unimaginably painful. But every single time I've had a painful experience that I thought was a bad experience, I saw on the other side that at some level there was some meaning to it. Not that every bad thing that happened to us will be able to actually see the full magnitude of its, of its positive impact in our lives. But say if you watch somebody else who actually does perish under their bad circumstances, usually at a higher level, collectively, somewhere, somehow, there, there's some sort of meaning for it in reality, whether it's to give rise to this or that or whatever. Even if in this life you can't zoom out high enough to see the big picture because we're locked in right here. Yeah, yeah. Which which kind of takes us, you know, even to just kind of bring it back a little bit. I know that we started this conversation with that. Where, yeah, okay, so where are we at with, with, with Calvin, true Calvin, all that kind of stuff. And then <laughs> we went here. Right off the deep end. But, but I, think, I think that it's, it's interesting, though, because yeah. a lot of this is some, is, is some really baseline just – you know, not only just like human personal development, but just like, you know, 
you know, you know, principles, uh, you know, philosophical principles uh, that that are centered around finding meaning and purpose, uh, and establishing some level of sanity and mental health, because we started there with it, and you know, the context of this conversation, I think, uh, you know, going back to, um, you, you know, circling back into various practices, you know, circling back to plant medicine, I think all of that is extremely relevant, because that's, uh, you know. That school of thought or just, you know, your meaning and purpose in general, what we can all agree upon that like are good things that we all objectively want are things that people are seeking when they're trying to expand their consciousness in any way. And I think it's good that we went into that because in order to talk about the potential cultural or large scale impact of any strategy that exp expands consciousness, we have to have some context as to what the significance of that is and the importance of it, you know. Psychedelics, for example, they've blown up, right? They've been rediscovered to some degree. But, you know, now we can, so most people, I don't want to say most people, but a lot of people are now aware that they exist, remember that they exist. And now would start the process of like, okay, well, what is the significance of a compound or a strategy that has the ability to, to, to expand our consciousness, expose our weaknesses, allow us to zoom out and really see ourselves from a much higher level than we, than we previously thought that we could or that we are able to if we're locked in ego consciousness that we don't even know that we're in because we've never been outside of it, right? Yeah. What is the value of having an experience of going outside your mind so you know what, you know what being inside your mind is? You know, It's all relativity, right? And so in, in, in any of these practices, Plant medicine is one of the main ones because it's one of the most powerful, like immediate press the button ones of going outside your mind. We all seek it. And I think some of the stuff we were talking about there was seeking meaning and everything like that. It's the reason why every culture around the world has always engaged in altered states of consciousness, some in a healthy way, some in an unhealthy way. But we all have that, I think we have that underpinning drive to alter our consciousness because we've evolved to the point which we can we can manipulate our reality as higher vertebrates, you know, and we're able to actually seek something that is innate with all of us where we seek to get out of our minds to understand more of the big picture, to understand ourselves, to answer the questions of the big why, right? Mm -hmm. Or just to get out of our minds to go a little bit deeper. That doesn't mean that everyone that goes out of their minds actually does those things. I'm talking about a subconscious drive so, so even if you're not consciously aware of it, and once you do those things, you do them, you use it as an escape, and you just, you just, you know, dick around while you're in those places or whatever, you know, <laughs> you know, then that that happens more time than 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 the. Can uh, hear the shaman the facilitator now. All right, this evening, don't dick around. Let's yeah. get some work done. <laughs> exactly. But it's like it's you know just because you've been to a expanded perceptual space doesn't mean you have the slightest damn clue as to where you've been on any level or understand the value of it or even care, by the way. That's a very good point. You know, many people just go because they want to be out of where they're at. Yeah. Right? And so, but but anyways, there's, but I, I do believe that there is still, there is still an underpinning drive in people to alter their consciousness. Yes. So one could have um, one of these out of body, out of mind, out of ego experiences but not necessarily come back with the practical um, utility of the experience. Yeah, or even intend to, right? I mean, uh, <laughs> <laughs> right. I want to see some freaky fractals, yeah. man. But but the main thing is is that there's really no question. I don't think that there's any way to make an argument for the fact that human beings have an instilled drive towards altering their consciousness. Anyone who's ever written book uh, books on on psychoactive. Um, you know, practices in general, or even foods or medicines, plant medicines, it is obvious that we have an obsession with altering our consciousness. Michael Pollan's written about this when he wrote a book about psychedelics. It's a really good book. Um, you know, we do. And I, th I think that part of what we're talking about in this conversation is, is at least on the track of, you know, some of the underpinning reasons why, you know, and we, we, we have an underpinning obsession. We crave it almost like we crave food or one of these, you know, survival things because we understand 
we don't necessarily consciously understand, but there's a part of us that's encoded that the process of life or the intelligence under us that's pushing us to do it. Almost like the uh, the conversation about you know the intelligence yeah. of nature pushing the plant to give something to us. This is so interesting. We are drawn. This is yeah. so interesting. Sorry to interrupt, but mm-hmm. I'm thinking about the cycle of addiction, right? And I was as you yeah, yeah. were speaking about all human beings invariably have this desire to alter their consciousness however they do it. I was thinking, wow, when I was a little kid, I mean, first I did it with sugar, then I did it with, you know, trying my first cigarette or watching horror movies or discovering pornography or whatever, right? Just like, I got to change the way I feel. And for the first half of my life, it was all about um, the avoidance of pain, right? It was out of that desperation. And then there's a certain turning point at which... I guess in one's development in some cases where the inspiration that we were talking about kicks in and then altering one's state of consciousness is coming more from the curiosity of inspiration rather than, you know, the aversion of pain. It's kind of like the attraction aversion model, right? It's like there's an attraction to deeper levels of understanding Mm -hmm. brought about by inspiration rather than like I'm trying to numb myself. And I think that's an important distinction. Mm -hmm. And I don't classify like, oh, this cocaine's a bad drug. Ayahuasca is a good drug because they all have their purposes. I mean, I don't want to go to the dentist without them putting some coca leaf extract in my gums. You know what I mean? Um, Heroin, you know, like, yeah, please give me morphine if I break my leg. Um, So it's not a good or bad thing. But there there is kind of a classification, I think, in in, at least with mind-altering substances in terms of do they bring one into a deeper relationship with who and what they really are or do they separate one from who and what they really are Mm -hmm. you know and that's an interesting kind of which comes to what you bring to it from an intention standpoint generally right right sometimes and sometimes what you well (laughs) there's a conscious intention and then there's an unconscious intention right because what a deeper part of you really wants sometimes you may not have any clue but you'll get what you really need, which is what a deeper part of you wants, right? That your ego or your conscious mind doesn't know. A lot of people know that. When they go into psychedelics, they think, hey, I'm going to get this. It's like, don't, don't make plans for psychedelics. <laughs> you <know? laughs> because what's going to happen is going to happen. And whether or not it's painful or something that you don't like or something that you need to address is, is, is one thing. Or maybe it'll be blissful and it'll be very nice and it'll be a very, very good both experience. But um, people who have good experiences are people who surrender to what – what automatically comes out the intention that's underneath that comes from that substrate you know that comes from that intelligence that goes deeper than even human body and and, you know human existence and just the core of who you are just tailored back into that substrate reality thing from my perspective um but anyways you know my whole point in that was just that no matter you know what your intention is from your conscious mind that underpinning drive there's almost like there's a magnetism there right like the opposite ends of uh, you know you know north and south on a magnet, like we are pulled towards altered states of consciousness. Now, we can we can either distort those once we engage in them with our conscious mind and our intentions. If we go into them with bad intentions, for example, and, or, or we resist what's the, the you know what it's it's really being pulled towards or for. Um, so if we engage in it from a desperation standpoint to escape pain then we're going to it for an escapism purpose in which you usually don't get great experiences or you just get meaningless experiences. You see good, fun things, you know, uh, but uh, and you can have a blissful experience where you're you know, running around in blades of grass and in kind of a state of astonishment or whatever. Um, but if you set the intention from an inspiration standpoint, that's where the personal growth comes because you're saying, I want to dig deep. And you, conscious, you, you consciously focus on those barriers and where are those things so I can pull out the weeds instead of just trying to go from the lawn with the weeds onto the nice lawn and roll around. (laughs) You know, Uh, (laughs) great metaphor. Yeah. (laughs) And actually quite realistic. Yeah. Right. You know, if you think about something like, like mushrooms, I mean, anytime I've been outdoors and Mm -hmm. taking mushrooms, I mean, there's been times where I have some realizations, but there have been many times where I'm like, look at this fucking grass. <laughs> Remember Terrence McKenna used to say, don't give in to astonishment. That was like uh, his, like his yeah. main like recommendation for psychedelic experiences because he said, you'll just get lost in escapism, right? right it's like, right. Th- that was that was why he said that, right? Yeah. Because you can, you can, you become fixated on an anthill mm-hmm. and just be like, it's one thing if, if you're astonished and, and you see the beauty in it and, and it, it leads to a deeper, uh, you know, th- thread that's wired into your, your own, internal state of it, you have all these realizations that can happen 
Uh, but if you just are just staring at it it's like, whoa, that's trippy, then then it's then you know you can get lost in that kind of escapism thing because it looks cool in that moment or whatever. So so you know the main point is is like intention can certainly affect it, but this underpinning drive is there. This underpinning drive towards altering your consciousness is there, which is why we're drawn to some of these different strategies. And so sort of tailoring it back to the whole plant medicine conversation. The reason why you know your plant medicine is coming up so much is because we are in desperate need of that alignment from good intention and our magnetism of being pulled, our 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 natural drive, our natural magnetism of being pulled towards altered states. Like it's clear that these things are surfacing in conversation. People are seeking them out, and we are in desperate need of 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 a proper alignment of good intention of inspiration, inspirational intent um, aligned with our natural drive towards altered states. And whenever we do that, we're interested in going into altered states that expand our consciousness, expand our awareness, that help us grow, to help us dissolve those perceptual boundaries, to help us to get back to the core, the framework of who we really are, and help us to actually align ourselves with the process of life we talked about earlier, which is everything that's good and conducting ourselves in a way through which life improves, which if there ever was a meaning to life, this is something that we can all agree upon, is conducting yourself in a way through which life objectively improves, right? To which your sip is floating higher, not sinking, right? You're right? And it's like, if you're doing things mm-hmm. which life improves, then that's meaningful and you're aligned with something that will fulfill you, right? It's like that, um, that principle, by their fruits you shall know them, yeah. Right. That's something that yeah. I, that I often think of, and I maybe more than think of, just mm-hmm. kind of apply to any endeavor. You know, it's like, huh? Let's just objectively take a reality check here and yeah. say, is what I'm doing making life worse or better? You know, yeah. you can yeah. break it down to something. So f- we're getting pretty deep here, but you can break it down to something so fundamentally yeah. simple. And this was a huge, I think, um, barometer or or test when I went from being 22 years stone cold sober as a former addict and alcoholic to exploring plant medicines and psychedelics. I mean, it was something I was extremely thoughtful about and, um, and, and, in, in, in which I had to exercise a lot of discernment and self checking, you know, what am I, what am I about to do here? Right. And in the course of the past few years that I've been with some degree of regularity exploring these realms, I've gone back to check myself. Are you cool, Luke? <laughs> what do you, what do you, do? again, another ceremony, you know? Um, but I do step back and I think over the years I've gotten a, 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 a fairly skilled at being honest with myself, um, as objective as one can be about their own, um, you know, behavior and, and results of that behavior. But I have looked at it and thought, huh, man, this is crazy, you know? I'm doing financially better than ever. Uh, my, you know, significant other, my wife, my relationship, the healthiest ever. My desire to have a family that I never had and I was terrified of. Um, just every physical, material manifestation um, of of my thoughts, feelings, and thus behavior has improved on a very measurable metric that is undeniable to anyone who would look at my life and go, man, he's really gone off the deep end. He's going downhill, like back into his old patterns or he's on the verge of a relapse. It's like, no, I'm doing better than ever before Mm -hmm. in a very concrete way. Mm -hmm. Not to say that, you know, there isn't plenty still to work on and I'm, I'm here for it, but I think it's, it's important to kind of take a look at oneself and it's pretty simple to see if you have some degree of, self-awareness to go is this a net benefit or a net deficit right you know and there's there's your answer right and i think for me in the realm of this topic um if there were negative consequences that were persistent i would choose a different path right and perhaps someday i will you know i might hit kind of a ceiling where i'm like okay i've Mm -hmm. kind of explored those realms as much as is productive and useful and i'm just going to go back to being a Householder that meditates a couple times a day and reads some spiritual literature yeah. and lays low, you know. Yeah. But it just there's just been continual expansion and benefit. Um, but I think largely because I have been prudent, right? You know, right. and it's I mean there's so many opportunities now, as you said, this prevalence of psychedelics and in, in our culture. I mean, unless you live somewhere very conservative or remote and it's just not part of your social circle, 
I think if you put any effort into seeking these experiences, they are widely available. Right. Yes. Um, and, and in my sphere of, of friends, um, it's very available and there are opportunities all the time. And I'd say 90% of them that come into my, um, you know, awareness, it's like, no, nah. usually it's a no or a not right now. Mm -hmm. And that helps me personally to determine when it's a yes, because there's, there's a really strong feeling that this is meant to be at this particular time right. in, in my journey and in my own development. Mm -hmm. But that discernment is really important because I think if one was just willy nilly about, you know, exploring these realms, there could be some pretty dire consequences. And, and this is widely reported of people having bad trips and, yeah, you know, yes. doing five MEO DMT and not coming down for six months. <laughs> you know, I mean, yeah. it can get super squirrely. So I, I like to, you know, just couch these topics sometimes and like, you know, an air of prudence, discernment, caution is wise, but it's also something that one can develop by looking at the results. Yeah. Right. You might and, have kind and, of a harrowing... finding an objective way of, of, of measuring your outcome. By by measuring the fruit that it's producing, yeah, right, yeah, and, and understanding that there are things that are objectively healthier and objectively not healthier is 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 your career improving, uh, your resource allocation improving. Are you, are is your life more stable? Are your friendships, relationships more stable, consistent? Are they healthy? Are they are are you in a state of growth, or is everything crumbling around you? Right. What you just said there, I think, is so important because it brings us kind of full circle back to what we were talking about earlier about the importance of left right brain hemisphere integration right, right? balance the the, yeah. the practical and measurable versus the intuitive right and so following your intuition and your emotion is incredibly important as sort of a compass set the you know set the trajectory but it's it's filtering it through an objective set of criteria of counting the fruit that you're producing right, right. that is going to tell you whether you're not you're crazy or you're a genius remember there's a there's a <laughs> that's good that's there's good. there's a yeah. an old saying the line between genius and insanity is measured only by success right so you know as where i mean think about it anybody who's ever changed the world in a positive way who's who's innovated anything who's created anything who's had an impact positive impact on the world for a period of time, they've had way more naysayers than yaysayers that have all said that they are crazy, okay? So you're, you know, the people, uh, you, you know, oftentimes, you know, the people who actually end up changing the world are the people that are crazy enough to actually believe that they can, right? And, you know, it's, it, that's basically, it's like, if you're entering into any expanded state of awareness in your life, right, through any, you know, whether it be, a, you know, an individual experience and an exploration or this that just puts you on a path or you're just going down a path where you are that's in uncharted territory. That integration is so incredibly important of, yes, you need to have that sort of, that sort of chaotic, um, uh, you know, all-encompassing, introspective, risk-taking even, emotionally, uh, you know, charged side of yourself because the emotion is like the path mainly to inspiration. It's what, the, the feeling of emotion, you know, because you know, inspiration and meaning is a, is a feeling. But if it's emotional intelligence, then you actually get to align yourself with something that gives you true inspiration that's real and not something that just feels good. See what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. yeah. Which is it's just so important. And I think most of this conversation, even though you know people listening might think, oh, this has gone in some all kinds of directions, but 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 you know, really, it really this this does it kind of comes full circle to the importance of investing in, um, well, you know, you know, obviously personal growth and development through, you know, you know, practices that help to balance your your, your perception you know, balance the duality and properly integrate duality, meaning like if we're talking physiological left, right brain, we're talking in that sense. Um, but, you know, the fact that all of these sides, we need to be aware of the sides of our duality um, and to find ways to properly integrate them because right now the biggest problem in the world, is, or <laughs> that's a bold statement, you know, a, a, I would say a huge problem in the world is certainly straight up division, you know, just perpetuated negative feedback loops, self-perpetuating, division which comes from an individual level non-integration right because whenever people are properly integrated they can see 
other people's perspectives and respect other people's perspectives and they check their ideas and the other person's ideas against the fruit, right? Objective reality. And so you end up agreeing a lot more because the fruit ultimately is the proof of like what, uh, it, it's the sum of how many of my ideas are working and how many of your ideas are working and then we measure it and that's really what the scientific method was before it's hijacked through, through various means, huh. uh, was, was meant to do, right? It was to take our inspiration but ground it into a practical, measurable, countable, counting fruit <laughs> that you're bearing, um, you, know, you know, sort of system methodology that it doesn't matter what I think or you think. I have my ideas and we chase, I chase my ideas, you chase your ideas. But at the end of the day, we count our fruit, you know, <laughs> and, and if I got more fruit than you and you, if I have eight pieces of fruit and you have none, clearly what I'm doing is working. And, and that's what it's, it's, it's meant to understand. And that right there is really where science and spirituality intersect, right? Which is like all, also duality, left, right, all that kind of stuff. Because science would be more obviously the practical, analytical, the measurable, counting the fruit, et cetera. And then obviously the, um, you, know, you know, spirituality would be more like the pursuit of truth, the introspection, just the, the broad exploration, just looking at the big picture, not focusing in and then actually you know, you know, taking, in, you know, snippets and executing individual things for specific experiences. Um, you know, so, you know, the fusion of those things is like just absolutely incredibly important. And that's where science and spirituality really do intersect and why it's not one or the other, right? We have to have rationality. We have to have introspection as well. And if we become too dominant in one side because we've let our traumas push us onto a team, which is something that's more in our primitive side, being on a team and, and tribalism and all that kind of stuff that's in our survival system. It's our survival system working against us, <laughs> you know, basically, that has brought us out of sync in our duality and pushed us to one side or the other. And then you get that polarity. Then the magnet is flipped and we're repelling each other instead of coming together. Um, then it's a huge problem. And so, it, so, so, again, I really think this conversation is important because, yes, we set out to talk about plant medicine. Yes, you know, I, I specialize in kava, and that's a very important piece, and we'll talk about that for sure. But it's important to understand the context of why these tools are important. Why they are, as let's just talk about, you know, the plants, for example. Why, why people are so drawn to psychedelics, first of all. And what, is, what could be the potential of the proper use of these things in order to really elicit collective growth as a species and of the whole organism of life on this planet, right? Uh, and people who have engaged in psychedelics, I mean, I, it's hard to find a community of people more passionate about anything like than the psychedelic community. Why? Because, because it's, you know, the experiences that you have when you really have a powerful psychedelic experience are truly outside of your mind. They are so expansive that what is there to be more passionate about than breaching through the boundaries of reality itself into new uncharted territory that could give us the answers to literally uh, all suffering, right? You know, possible, or at least, you know, one step at a time or all that we're able to do in this life, in this reality, whatever. It's like, what could be more important? And, and so, uh, you know, this, this conversation is getting more relevant all the time, right? Everything, there's so much about plant medicine you know, today. There's so much desire towards plant medicine. They're all becoming legalized, uh, you know, slowly, right? And people are just obsessed with them. The biggest podcasters in the world or the biggest people who become the biggest voice in the world are actually people, many of them, Joe Rogan, very good example, you know, like who have largely gained a lot of popularity by being an advocate for those things and the thoughts that expand out of them, right? You know, uh, that co those conversations, let's take that podcast for example. It's, it's like the biggest one in the world. All of those are very, very psychedelic-like conversations or conversations uh, that are very, very open and fully integrated and that respect, usually try to respect both sides of that coin that we're talking about. And people are drawn to that. No matter how long the conversation is, for three hours, people are hungry for growth, they're hungry for truth, they're hungry to just become better. Doesn't mean it's like some kumbaya reality where it's like you take some plant and it's like you're gonna like 
ascend to the heavens tomorrow or something. It's a, no, but it, and there's no one magic bullet. It's an opportunity. The, uh, you know, all these things are tools for personal growth and development. And anything that opens up larger opportunities, you know, for us to just become better and to just become more of who we really are and find meaning, fulfillment, and purpose, I think is just so important incredibly important so yeah so we could talk yeah. specifically about plant medicine now if you want to <laughs> that is is that not what we just did no <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> um i want to tell everyone that the show notes for this episode can be found at lukestory.com slash cameron and we'll also have a link uh in the show notes to true kava with a discount code that i forget right at the moment but i'm sure we have one and also we'll put your past episodes linked in there too because mm. like your story is incredible and we've touched on it both in our both uh mm. prior conversations so i kind of have avoided it this time because i don't want to be redundant for people that heard it but your story is fucking awesome too and maybe we can kind of tie in addiction at some point but i want to let people know again lukestory.com slash cameron any links books anything we've talked about will be found there um so one thing I wanted to actually see if I could find to put in the show notes, and I want to share it with you too. I could text it to you if and when we're able to find it. But the other day, I'm like scrolling on Instagram, and or maybe someone sent me. I think a, it was a TikTok video, and it was um, I don't know if you've seen this where people have figured out how to put basically little microphones on plants, and mm. the plants actually talk or make music. So essentially, they they kind of get these ultra sensitive microphones put them on plants and then run those through an amplifier and, and plants make songs and kind of have language. It's really trippy. So someone sends me this TikTok and it's a big reishi mushroom grown in mm. a lab and the fucking mushroom is talking. It's talking. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's that's the only way to describe it. Mm -hmm. And it's talking in this alien like ET language. <laughs> Insane. I mean, that's just like one example of how much we don't know and and kind of the arrogance of the collective human consciousness to think that we are the only sentient beings that carry intelligence you know back to what we were talking about earlier of the the possibility of perhaps some of these plant medicines like kava or kratom or psilocybin or any of them kind of starting to emerge into culture perhaps with the motivation from god head or consciousness as a whole not that like i think oh this plant is a living being and it's like i'm gonna fly from peru to california you know not in in that kind of simplistic sense but just in the macro that these things do have an intelligence because they're part of the greater intelligence of creation itself right and so creation is kind of working its intelligence through something like a reishi mushroom that then is mic'd up and starts talking to you yeah. you know and so it's just really fascinating to me um, as a Westerner to start to come to these realizations. But if you tap into the indigenous cultures of history, uh, they predominantly already know this. It, this is like big <laughs> news to me because I see a reishi mushroom talking and yeah, you, yeah. you could talk to a South American elder or Native American, you know, elder. And they'd be like, duh, we've been telling you guys this for 20,000 years or whatever, you know. Anthropologists think that it's just metaphorical. They're like, oh, these people just, you know, they just kind of like are poetic or something, you know. Yeah. And, and they are, you know. And, and, I mean, shamans, you know, certainly can be. But it's it's like, well, no, they've, they've lived very, very close to the natural ecology and to each other in, in a sense of community. It's where we've created a lot of these artificial boundaries, barriers, boxes, um, you know, and just, just, just endless sort of segments of divorcement from nature through which we've kind of lost some of those signals, right? We've become numb to them, right? We've yeah. atrophied. It does, you know, it, atrophied it, it, is a good word. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. My, my wife, Allison recently uh, published a book called animal power and it's all about the intelligence and symbolism of the animal kingdom. It's a hundred animals. A little shout out to Allison's book there. It's incredible. You can find it at, no, I'm just kidding. We'll put it in the show notes. <laughs> but you know, when I first um, got involved with her and, and, and she's a shaman and works in ways that I don't totally understand, perhaps I'm atrophied a bit. And so she's starting to write this book and She's explaining to me the, you know, the wisdom of the owl or the caterpillar and, and these different things. And I'm, you know, respectfully curious, but kind of like, you know, just because an eagle flies by, it doesn't necessarily mean anything. Right. Because it's that reductionist sort of yeah. materialistic, pragmatic 
part of me that just thinks, oh, it's a coincidence. But it's sort of like, and I want to get your take on this, in, in terms of the, the animal and plant kingdom and just our natural environment here on Earth, it seems like you kind of end up in either nothing is random and nothing is accidental or everything is. And there's this nihilistic sort of defeatism in the everything is random and it's a lot less fun. And it's sort of like, well, why pursue any understanding if it just is all meaningless and we're all floating on a rock, right? And it's just mm -hmm. like destiny is predetermined. So I'm beginning to lean more into that. What if everything, including that eagle flying by or the, the reishi mushroom having its own language, mm -hmm. what if all of that does in fact have meaning and that I have just become atrophied as a, as a coexisting being here on this planet? whether it's by, you know, the medicines we've been speaking of or not, or just other ways, but how about just kind of changing my degree of open-mindedness to just consider, wow, maybe there is a lot more going on here than meets the eye and being open to and curious about all levels of consciousness and intelligence and inspiration as it comes into our awareness. In other words, kind of putting up one's antenna for maybe there are signs that aren't just hocus pocus you know, maybe maybe things that I just wrote off as an accident or insignificant actually have a tremendous amount of significance in terms of when an animal enters my life and what it could mean or the fact that these plants are now traveling around the world seemingly on their own, you know, with a little help from humans and airplanes. So I don't know that there's a question in that. I think it's just it's a self-inquiry and an exploration into perhaps regaining some of that innate wisdom that we've lost in our, in our modern culture, especially in, in the West, you know, and as we're joking, you know, people figured this out a long time ago yeah. and the anthropologists are like, ah, they're, they were superstitious, you know, well, maybe they weren't, maybe yeah. they aren't, maybe there's something there for us to learn and, and honor and respect and, and allow ourselves to be teachable and to um, divorce ourselves from some of that, the arrogance that the ego um, embeds in us as thinking we know more than we actually do. It's so interesting too. I mean, because you, you mentioned, um, well, just kind of the old saying that's like, well, you know, which was basically, or, or is similar to what you just said, um, how, you know, those two absolute perspectives of life that either, either everything is a miracle or nothing is right. Um, which actually you know, it, it tends to be where people tend to go. It's like if you, you know, I volunteered in a, in a nursing home whenever I was young and uh, I learned a lot in that experience. One thing that I observed almost immediately was that, that there were two types of people in those situations where they were horribly deteriorated or just very elderly and not in good health. There were people who were the sweetest, nicest people who saw the meaning in everything that 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 were you know totally at ease with where they were at that uh that that had uh you know a sense of like this is where i'm at you know i've lived a great life that kind of thing just you know very very peaceful people and then there was people um who were the exact opposite that were very bitter uh that were very angry they were very scared that are very um uh you know resentful and the worst thing that are full of regret, right? Because people at, in their final stages, it's one of the worst things probably a human being can experience is to be full of regret. You know, you know, saying, gosh, I wish I would have done more. And they tell you about regrets that will literally just pierce your soul, you know, motivate you, <laughs> you know, for sure. But anyways, you know, the point of that is that like you've this, this, this tendency of people to kind of go into these two extremes. And honestly, it's not just one or the other. It's not like everything or nothing. It's like, there's actually a spectrum kind of, you know, just like anything else where, you know, people are kind of down the road of bitter, but maybe they can see, you know, some of the meaning and things. And it's, it's like, we're complex and stuff, but they tend, you people tend to polarize just like going back to the conversation earlier about how we tend to under states of trauma, we tend to divert, we tend to polarize, we tend to move into, one side of duality, one side of our individual consciousness, because that's an absolutist thing. It's because when our fight or flight system takes over, fight or flight is a very absolute thing. It's fight or flight. It's very clear. Get the hell away or fight this thing, right? And that's, that's, that's an action that is actually then sort of encodes a, 
a you know a a reaction that is absolute like moving from one side to the other right i'm over here so i'm going to go over there i'm going to retreat to this or whatever you know and so people you know generally i mean especially under trauma um or it's 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 usually formed from some form of uh, hardship or trauma that brings people out of sync or out of balance with their with duality or hemispheres they're conscious I mean, we're humans that's actually part of being human is kind of coming out of that and then trying to find ways to move back in it's not saying that it's a bad thing but it's 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 something you know that's uh, that's important to talk about but um it that is important because uh you know that whole idea that everything's a miracle or, or that nothing is is kind of that same thing right either you move into that side of duality or that just sort of reductionist, highly rational, extreme rational state where it's like you're just reality perceptually shifts for you, literally shifts for you into this just mundane process of just dead, you know, mechanical circumstances. My physical body, I'm trapped in this. It sucks. I'm, I'm going to die and fuck you and uh, this whole thing, you know. And then, <laughs> and, and just like I got to get I got to pay bills and, and Lord, you know. Um, and, uh, you know, and then there's the side of things that's really kind of the other side, um, that kind of sees the meaning in things that's, um, but not, that doesn't necessarily see like the individual or the rational, which actually would be more of what a lot of indigenous people are because they didn't, they didn't live in the era of like rationalism. They actually, in, in many ways probably became, you know, more straight introspective than they were, um, you know highly highly analytical or overly analytical but still had to be practical because they had to survive during harsh circumstances so many were actually probably more balanced on that front um but uh you know it's like you know going to these opposite sides or going to these extremes right of like everything is a miracle meaning that you can kind of see everything for more of what it is and you can kind of see the big picture through your introspective more creative side um or you're locked into individual what's right in front of you, just dead and reductionist. Cause that's kind of what analysis is. It's like, it's like sequencing. It's like one individual process at a time. You just see what's right in front of you and what's literally like right there. Right. Um, so again, you know, you know, another example of how, you know, duality is sort of, you know, you know, tears apart that, that integration. Um, and you have people in those two categories, you know, um, and that, and that's, I believe that's one reason why people can be so far apart on how they see reality, because at the end of the day, this whole conversation that we're having around, around consciousness, around perceptual duality, which is really what, what we're talking about, um, left, right, light, dark, you know, you know, creative, rational, um, which are just, you know, sub, you know, sort of layers of, of, of the same principle this this entire conversation around this um is sort of relative to our ability to be able to perceive objective truth we all can agree that there is an objective truth that exists outside of my perception or your perception right for example which is great because we can we can measure the fruit, right? We can measure that through the language of science and mathematics, which is great about the time that we live in today if it's kept in balance. For example, if I go on top of this roof, I step off the roof. I can believe that I can fly, right? Subjectively, I can have an emotion. I could take a drug that could give me an emotion and be like, I can fly off this thing. It doesn't matter in that moment what my emotion is. There is an objective truth, an objective force an objective truth of reality, in this case gravity, that's going to pull me down no matter what I think or believe, right? So that's an objective truth. It doesn't matter my truth, this whole thing, you know, you know, today, you know, people kind of going into my truth or your truth. It's the truth. And what we're trying to do is to integrate ourselves and develop ourselves enough to where we can tune our antennas to be able to get the best signal of the truth as possible, you know, <laughs> to be able to tune into to the most inclusive, clear picture of the truth, you know, like the old TVs where you're like trying to get the antennas right and the pictures kind of come in there, you know, and you want to get it there. You're like trying to adjust it, you know, that's, that's I, I, that's kind of what I feel like, right. In the process of growth is like, I want to know the truth, not what, just what I feel. Your feelings can betray you. Your feelings are important, but remember, count the fruit, right? <laughs> Tell you whether or not your feelings are correct or your feelings are not, you know? So 
the whole goal for anything is to get to the truth because the truth, I guess, it will set you free, right? And the truth is where we grow. The truth is where we solve problems. And the truth is, is just where well, real life happens, like good things happen, anything that we would associate with being good. So this, I think this entire conversation really does kind of circle back around to, okay, like we're talking about perceptual duality and the importance of that. And yes, because we started talking about plant medicine as that, as a prime, very, you know, real strategy, that is the goal. That's, I believe that's one of the reasons why we're possibly drawn to that is, is to try to, by getting outside our minds, by zooming out, which psychedelics have a tendency to be able to do, it, it gives us a perspective to where we can see the separation between our two halves and then try to formulate a big picture strategy. Instead of just living in dots, instead of just seeing pixels, it allows us to better see pictures, right? And then we can start to connect the dots. If you're just zoomed in because your trauma has pushed you into one perceptual state, rationalism or, or pure introspection without rationalism, pure creativity or whatever, then it's it zooms you into this very isolated, non-all-inclusive sort of dot, right? So you're living in that little dot, right? But what that sort of left-right brain hemisphere integration or that, uh, you know, you know, perceptual duality integration, the, the more that that happens, I believe, you know, the more that it zooms you out and allows you to connect the dots. And then you get a picture, and that picture is, is the truth, right? Because it's measurable. You can literally measure the distance between the dots once you see them and blah, blah, blah. And you, that's, again, that goes back to counting the fruit and looking at, okay, what's objectively true there. So I think that that's, that's, uh, in, that's my perspective anyways as far as like, you know, um, you know, the importance and, you know, some of the importance and, the, and you know, the reason I, that, uh, or the possible reason why um, we're drawn to, to all practices for, for personal growth. Yeah, um, to to arrive at a um, at a universal truth that then becomes our compass, right? Cause right, right. Much of the folly of humanity is just our lack of ability to discern truth from falsehood. We yeah. just literally suck at it. Yeah, <laughs> most of the time, right? Yeah. I mean, you just look at any of the you know the mass suffering that um, that humans have endured at the hands of other sociopathic humans right. that were led to slaughter because they couldn't discern you know good from evil or truth from falsehood mm -hmm. so anything we can do to kind of arrive at that as we've been discussing here uh, for me that's like that's where you find your true north Mm -hmm. I, ideally, right? I mean, that's what that's what we want is to have some sense of direction that is mm -hmm. uh, reliable and is going to take us to where we want to go. Um, I want to ask you now. We've covered it in the past two episodes quite extensively, but we've talked about kava as one of these medicines mm -hmm. that I think is really valuable, especially. Uh, there's so many people in fight or flight over the past couple of years. And I think like our nervous systems, myself included for various reasons are just fried and tapped out. And so, you know, in the furthest end of the spectrum, you have a, well, not a plant medicine, but a, um, a substance like 5 meo DMT from the animal kingdom, from the, the Bufo toad, right. Is maybe like, well, not maybe for me, the most expansive of all possible human experiences while you're still in a body. Um, down to some of the more subtle that are more in the adaptogenic herb kind of medicine space, which I would consider kava to be something that can be used daily, continually, um, no known side effects, has compound benefits over time, but isn't going to take you into the stratosphere you know, of galactic consciousness, you know, and uproot you from rationalism as much. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So maybe for, for, for those that have heard the word Kava kind of dropped in this conversation and this being the one thing that you focused in on and, and formed your company true Kava around, give mm -hmm. us a little bit of a breakdown for people that don't end up finding it in the show notes. Yeah, exactly. You know, so Kava is, it's one of the, it's one of the most probably, you know, lesser known, underreported, underappreciated, really unique, very relevant, I would say more relevant than ever, plant medicines in this wheelhouse of therapeutic entheogenic compounds, but that also bridge into a physiological medicine and an adaptogenic medicine as well too. So kava is kind of like this overlap. It's kind of like this sort of this this meshed sort of almost like, you know, you know, connector or, or you know, grouped overlap um, you know, uh substance in terms of its broad spectrum of therapeutic effects, you know, um, uh, characteristics and applications, um, you know, between 
the standard physiological plant medicines, the adaptogenic herbs <coughs> that are basically <coughs> act as more nutrients that you can use on a regular basis to build the, the physical body over time. And the medicines like we've been talking about, the tryptamine psychedelics, the ones that really bring you into a hyper-perceptual state that give that opportunity to go outside the mind <coughs> and elicit um, you know, spiritual, psychological, mental, and personal growth from a mindset perspective, um, it, it kind of bridges the gaps and takes some of the best elements of all of those things. So it, it kind of takes some of the best effects of alcohol, coffee, CBD, <coughs> it kind of takes some of the best effects of alcohol, coffee, CBD, microdosing certain psychedelics, um, adaptogenic herbs, and it has qualities and characteristics that bridge over all of those substances, which is extremely relevant, obviously, because that gives it a level of versatility and um, the potential for widespread integration into the culture th uh, that a lot of these other substances lack due to their limitations in one category or the inverse. For example, reishi mushroom is a great, a great physiological medicine. And even uh, it's, it's great for the psyche too as far as an adaptogenic herb. It's a great what the Chinese call a shin tonic. It does help with the emotions, but, but it's not you know, psychoactive in that, in that sense. It, it's great for the immune system, great for the whole body. It's, it's more like a nutrient daily sort of tonic type of thing as where, you know, 5-MeO or, you know, ayahuasca, DMT, these, these powerful, powerful psychedelic, uh, you know, plants, you know, and, and other organisms uh, are lacking on the physiological nourishment side of things and, uh, in fact, can actually – are so powerful, can actually pull from the physiological – um, in order to get that experience, it's like you're, you're spending a little bit of your physical currency, your energy to be able to do that, which is why preparation recovery is so important for like if you're taking heavy hits of LSD or something like that. So, you know, all the plant medicines sort of have their place, all the most relevant ones that are kind of like all of them are, are exploding in this, this, this renaissance thing that we're experiencing, right? I mean, you know, health food stores are exploding with, you know, these adaptogenic, you know, nutritional um, you know, medicinal mushrooms, people are putting them in coffee and they're just exploding into sort of mainstream use and all this stuff and different herbs because people, there's a great need for them. There's a pressure, there's a need. And the psychedelics are obviously exploding for all the reasons that we just covered and, and you know, for the, the draw to human consciousness and everything, expanding consciousness. Um, but they all have kind of their limitations and, and every plant compound has its limitations. What interested me so much in kava, besides the fact that it was necessary for me to, to survive in my circumstance because it was able to stop my convulsions and seizures and so it was like a that was a, a desperation thing of how i got into it but like we talked about earlier a, a desperation quickly turned into an inspiration once once i got that specific benefit of it and then got these other unintended effects and started to realize all the potential that this plant medicine held and just really dove headfirst into the indigenous people of the south pacific all the anthropological information historical accounts and started to really understand what this plant is as an organism and what it is as an intelligence and how that intelligence manifests in this thing, both from, you know, you know, a philosophical standpoint, but also from an objective scientific standpoint, because it's most it's one of the most well studied herbs in the world outside of cannabis and ginseng. So you can place these two things together and that's how we count the fruit on that one. <laughs> you know. <clears throat> so but what interested me and fascinates me to this day and makes me so excited about Kava is that is its its potential, let's say you know, on the, on the psychedelic side of things, on the, on the, you know, you know, mental, emotional, uh, you know, perspective based, you know, medicinal aspect of things. Um, it has these qualities where in high dosages, even in moderate dosages, even in low dosages to some degree, um, you know, instigates this left, right brain hemisphere hyperconnection or, you know, sort of interaction through various chemical pathways, the dopamine system, GABA system, serotonin system, cholinergic system, et cetera, and others as well. Um, that, you know, gives this very, very clear experiences that indigenous people have always reported on that now we're starting to kind of be able to put together with some of the scientific literature that, uh, uh, that you know, brings about these sort of introspective states of mind that we've been talking about this whole time. Um, but not, not like in a sledgehammer, whack you over the head, like take you completely out of your mind where you visually are seeing, you know, a totally different side of reality like DMT would, right? It's doing it sort of in the back of your mind. 
especially in high dosages, to where like you're having conversations like we're having now, and if you notice, you're drinking kava like you are now. Um, all of a sudden, you start to realize that you kind of get into more of a flow state, where all of a sudden it's easier for you to put these thoughts together. It's easier for you to kind of zoom out and to kind of connect the dots and kind of reflect on your past experiences, your current life framework, your whole perceptual timeline of like, okay, what I did the last last you know few months. It's easier to kind of reflect and have access to those things during these like enhanced states of mind, it's certainly with really powerful psychedelics, but for the case of this, for sure. So, so it has an element of that to it. And that's something that's – that's why it's so heavily prized in the South Pacific, which for those who don't know, we talked about on past episodes. Kava is the most sacred substance in, in all of the South Pacific and these South Pacific countries, uh, which, which are countries that, are, that have indigenous people that are very, very in tune and live very close to nature uh, because they have the elements, obviously, of the ocean and the, you know, their environment, their landscape, and they've lived basically a third world lifestyle in villages for so long and in tight-knit communities. And they discover ways of of you know instigating um, you know you know deeper connection with the environment and with one another because they see it as uh, not only a way of s- good survival but you know a, a thriving set of circumstances as well. But anyways, it's 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 the most sacred substance in these islands for a reason because um, you know because it has this psychological medicinal effect on the mind. Uh, and they notice this as we're an average person that just drinks at once, especially a person who's out of tune with that side of themselves would just be like, oh, it's just mildly relaxing, you know, or whatever, and maybe didn't take high enough dosages or whatever. But over time, even if you don't realize that it's happening, what we see anthropologically and what we even see now observationally and objectively in some of the studies now is we see a a a objective marked change and shift in behavior in the positive direction on average in people whenever they consume kava on a regular basis. This is something that is objectively observed in, in, in every way that you slice it. And the reason is, is because when you spend, when you, because of kava's versatility, because it doesn't whack you over the head or deplete you and it actually helps to balance your brain chemistry and kind of feed your brain chemistry and replete your brain chemistry at the same time, it creates the opportunity for you to engage in a subtle, very subtle, entheogenic, expanded state of consciousness consistently, sometimes daily over long periods of time, right? As where heavy, heavy psychedelics, you hit hard and you can't do it all the time. Some people do it fairly regularly if, they're, if they take care of themselves and blah, 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 but you can't do it every day, you know? And, and then sometimes doing strong experiences and then using... Tools like Kava in between can help you reflect better on those very strong experiences as well, too. So it has, their, has its time and place. But the indigenous people of South Pacific, they have access to psilocybin mushrooms. They, they, you know, Kava is their most sacred substance because of its versatility. Because it, it has the ability to, to you know, consistently whisper this, this message. And it allows you know, for good integration whenever you can get these whispers and kind of get the message slowly over time, right? And you can it, it, it just it changes your thought patterns. When you spend that much time in perceptual states that are enhanced like that, your brain starts to rewire itself, right? Because anytime you have a thought, a feeling, or an emotion, your brain's re- rewiring itself, neuroplasticity. You know, think of it like, you know, every thought that you have is like driving down, it's like you have a clean slate of, say, snow, right? And that's kind of what, what your brain is, landscape. Every time I have a thought, every time I hear a new idea or go down a certain path of thinking, I make a new path in that snow, right? And, right? and so that's like a new connection. I bridge those connections. And so then your brain, in order to conserve energy, it's, it prioritizes traveling paths that are already have been traveled a lot because it already finds its way through that. It doesn't have to exert the energy to find and make a new path, right? To push snow out of the way the next time. So the brain does the same very thing. When you spend time in a perceptual state, it starts to create new neurological structures and ways of habitual thinking uh, that become easier and easier to access, right? Um, And it creates new neurological structures that solidify those, new synaptic connections that solidify those things. So your brain is constantly changing itself. There's actually a book called The Brain That Changes Itself. It's about neuroplasticity, right? So this is why all psychedelics lead to you know, changes in perception and changes in the way that people perceive and reflect on their past circumstances. And, and if they 
they can sh- shift the perception or relationship to a past like you know traumatic event or a current event they can change the way their body reacts to it hence application for PTSD etc yeah you know i've experienced that <sighs> Yes, yes. Ad infinitum. So <laughs> it's astonishing, actually, yes, the ability yes. for the brain. Yes, and so that to, happens incredibly yeah. powerfully during yeah. like these sledgehammer experiences with powerful, and sometimes that's needed, right? So those the, the powerful psychedelics have their absolute place. What excites me about kava is that it's this hidden gem of something that one of the biggest barriers with classic psychedelics is the lack of versatility, right? I mean. In order to get a good experience at a psychedelic, you got to take some serious care and precautions, right? You got to go into it with intent, and you got to go into it, you know, prepared usually, and you've got to like sanction it, like in in culture and society, for a lot of reasons. As we integrate these things, they have to be in a medical context, right? People can go off and do them responsibly on their own, but if we we can't just like release them into culture because the culture isn't ready for it, they're just too strong. So, so there's a lot that needs to be built out over time with those. And that means that the amount of people that can access them is going to be a, a smaller group, at least, you know, for the time being, right? Like, you know, your, your 80-year-old grandmother is probably not going to, you know, jump into psilocybin, right? You know, it's like it's just for a lot of reasons. Uh, you know, younger people or just people who just – don't even know that there's value in psychedelics. They're not going to jump. You're not. They're not going to agree to that kind of a commitment, right? You know, but they will take something that that is extremely subtle that has all of these other relaxing benefits and feels good, but then has that as an extra adjunct to it, and it can start to kind of teeter in some of these states of mind. So I kind of see kava as something that anybody can have access to both for its physiologic benefits, which are more relevant than ever today, because kava primarily has two tiers to it. It's physiological benefits and it's psychological benefits. Indigenous people, like I said, mainly prize its psychological benefits. But in today, we've got so many stress-related diseases. Kava is a protective substance, like we talked about in the last episode, that has all these neuro and tissue protective mechanisms, anti-inflammatory, stress reduction. It's most famous for being like an alcohol alternative, something that you can relax because it acts like a benzodiazepine that's not addictive and it helps to restore the brain systems and all of that stuff, um, which, which is obviously phenomenal, um, which is great for application for the physiologic dependence of addiction. But it also helps with the emotional and psychological aspect of, say, addiction or for PTSD over time, not like all at once, which is what's so great about it is that like, the more you take it, not only does it does it reduce the physiologic cravings uh, for, say, said substances that people are physiologically addicted to, or help to reduce the symptoms of chronic disease that are stress related, like lack of sleep and uh, and you know, pain and all these things, um, you know, you know, nerve pain and anxiety and depression and those things. It helps to relieve those in the short term, but then it also works underneath on the psyche, and which gives the opportunity for a person to reflect and get to the underlying psychological, emotional, and perceptual reasons, like lack of um, perceptual integration, like we talked about earlier, uh, of why they felt the need to engage in escapism to begin with. Because at the end of the day, people engage in escapism primarily because they have a meaning and purpose deficiency in their life, right? They need an adventure. They need an adventure that means something, and life is an adventure. And so you can simulate one by just skipping the whole physiologic experience part and just pressing the button, you know, of that dopamine that would normally naturally come at the end of the assembly line <laughs> of processes, <laughs> right? Right. Uh, once you get that adventure or that purpose, you do get these spurts of dopamine and serotonin. But that's a way of hacking it. That's what addicts tend to do, taking the shortcut, which is, you know, part of uh, the whole thing of the whole, you know, you know, victimhood process of, of escapism and the whole thing that leads to that. And that's kind of, you know, a little, little, just a little side trail about specifically addiction. But I was talking about the, all of the, um, you know, you know, the physiologic benefits, obviously, to Kava, and then, you know, the psychological benefits at the same time. So basically, I, I say all that to kind of give a kind of a broad context and a little bit of a review of what we talked about last time of what Kava's basic benefits are, its lowest hanging fruit, which is all the physiologic stuff. But what's most exciting to me is that it offers this great physiologic relief to these stress-related conditions and depression and these mental illnesses and stuff. And yes, a tapering agent from the actual physical dependency side 
of the of of say addiction, which is a huge thing right now. Um, but really, what we want to get to is not only the underlying reasons of what caused the addiction, but we also want to get through the addiction and use and and transform that desperation that came through the inv- through the addiction into the inspiration that comes through a more aligned, integrated perspective in that duality integration that can come through some of these practices, in my opinion. Awesome, man. Thank you for that. I love talking to you, bro. Oh, thanks, man. You're you're a fascinating (laughs) guy. Thanks. You're one of those guys, when I see you at conferences and Mm -hmm. out and about, we'll have conversations like this, and I'm always like, ah, we should be recording this, man. This This is gold. (laughs) <laughs> so I'm glad we got to sit down and uh, and do this today. And thank you for illuminating all that you did. And, and also about Kava, man, because I'm a huge fan. And um, speaking of which, I got a question for you. Um, a couple of years ago, you sent me some really high quality Kava root. I think it was like three or four strains. Mm-hmm. And you're like, dude, these are really special. Hang on to these. And you sent me a video on how to cook it properly mm-hmm. and get the extract, um, which I did a few times. And it was extremely euphoric and amazing. And then I moved and put my stuff in storage for a year. And then I just found it when we were unpacking. I was like, what is that word? Kumbi, you be boogie boo. And I was like, oh, it's that kava. Do you think it's still good if it was sealed in an airtight? Yeah, because it, it was dry. Thing? Yeah, okay. It, it, it'll be good still. Okay, it cool. It lost a tad bit of potency, but it'll be good okay. still. It'll be fine. Yeah, because yeah. I'm, I'm a huge fan. And also, um, it's worth noting, and I'll just state as someone who's, you know, I've gone to kava bars and... Even back in the day, I used to buy kava little capsules at Whole Foods. and I've never really noticed much of an effect, honestly. And having you send me those, which was kind of like super strong, gold standard, rarefied um, strains of just the raw herb, Mm -hmm. um, you've really done it right with the true kava. So I want people to understand. I mean, not that there are no other companies in the world that are any good at it, but I want people to know, like, if they think they've tried kava and they're like, I didn't experience what he just described, mm-hmm. it's probably because you had some subpar, subpar version of it that wasn't, you know, at the right strain or cultivated right or was the aerial parts instead of the root or whatever it might have been. So I want to um, encourage people to check out the formulas that you've created because I'm a huge fan, obviously. Yeah, and even just to end with, uh, like, a little, you know, kind of, you know, practical, more grounded, just quick message just about, you know, you know, Kava application in general and, you know, available Kava products or just Kava as a tool. You know, remember it's, it's, it's main applications, it's lowest hanging fruit applications are all extremely relevant. Um, You know, you have the anxiety relief, you've got the antidepressant effects, you've got the social lubricant effects, um, you've got um, the anti-inflammatory effects, the protective effects, but just from an experience standpoint of what someone might experience, we talked a lot about this really deep side of kava because we've we've built up to it in a couple episodes, and so there's definitely a lot more information on a lot of the specific like mechanisms and stuff of kava in the past episodes. If you guys want to check those out, um, but you know, just the experience of kava, it's it's just so nice to have something that I think a lot of people are looking for today. Uh, where people, you know, for the first time, even the age group of like 18 to 25 year olds are starting to, to, you know, um, move away from alcohol use, like, you know, percentages, amounts of people, uh, even of the young age groups are starting to be less and less interested in alcohol because of this drive towards, you know, it, you know, a healthy lifestyle and actually being cool now to, to like, to seek health, even if it's, if the avenues that you're chasing are right or wrong or whatever, it's just like a thing. Um, but it is nice to have something that you can you can use as an ally, not a vice, right? That can help you relax and assist you, uh, in w- which is really what alcohol or you know drug taking like really should be, which is what we're trying to do. At the end of the day, none of us want to be addicted to drugs and alcohol. None of us want to like be out of our minds and get in fights. We're just trying to like feel good and relax whenever we go to the bar and drink and things go bad, right? (laughs) Sometimes, you know, things can go bad or they can get out of control and they can get out of control with a lot of these substances. And I I just think that, you know, it's, it's so good to have something that you can just use, um, that you don't have to feel bad about and you can use regularly, even if you still drink, especially if you drink on the weekends or this or that, but you can just use as something that, will nourish your body, is a medicinal herb at the same time, but it can also give you that relaxation in a very smooth, natural way that just be naturally uplifted and kind of you just feel like more of yourself. You, you come alive a little bit. You're able to socialize and connect better, which is really why people take 
drugs most of the time to begin with, uh, as far as alcohol is concerned. And it, it's just great to have something that you can use as a recreational tool. You can use for medicinal application for all sorts of ailments, which most ailments today, chronic ailments, are stress related. Uh, you know, you can use, uh, you know, in context where you're trying to to transition uh, to have as an ally to transition off of, you know, bad physiologic dependence, the imprisonment, the enslavement of what we've both been through in our lives, the hell of addiction to some of its nasty substances. There's other tools, and kava is just a great tool that you don't have to worry about. It's like you know, you know, it's like you know, people you know trying to get off opiates. There's all kinds of really aggressive, pretty dangerous ways of getting off of them. You know, methadone. It's like replacing one opiate for another toxic substance. You know, just having something that you can go to to really try that just helps across the board in all of these things. It's just it's it's a protector. It's an ally. It's something you can go to and you can actually feel good about taking. Like you're doing something for yourself at the same time. Uh, you know, and it's a tool to be used. Uh, and I think it's, it's, it's a really great one. And I think that, uh, just like coffee helped to help back in the early 1900s, helped to shape the collective mind of Western culture. Uh, Michael Pollan wrote a book on that and talked to, talked about it on Joe Rogan's podcast kind of recently about how that was the case. It helped to shape the rational mind of the culture and the highly, you know, productivity focused side of things. Alcohol has shaped the perceptual mind of how we socialize in a lot of ways. Psychoactive substances that we choose to engage in play a huge role in in um, how we connect as individuals, right? And I I just think that at some point, I really believe that kava will be as common as a cup of coffee, and I think that it bridges a lot of these gaps, a lot of these medicines. I just think it's really important for people to explore and to know about and to, um, you know, if they feel compelled, you know, you know, give it a try and and certainly look into it whenever they're studying and looking at all of their options as far as you know, allies in the plant kingdom, right? Or nutrients or just strategies for personal development and wellness. It's one thing, you know, the end of the, at the end of the day, what gets people well, what changes people's lives is always a multi-therapeutic approach, right? There's not a magic pill or potion or lotion or whatever, but it is the integration of these things. And there are some really powerful tools that I think surface at times where they're really needed. Uh, and this is a really powerful one. And all of the other psychedelics also, are extremely powerful ones, and I'm really excited about the time we live in because we're rediscovering some of these tools that I think are really going to play a big contribution in saving surfing certain aspects of of humanity and culture, or at least create the opportunity for that. So, I I, I do think it's important, and that's kind of a practical message mixed with a higher <laughs> higher bird's eye view message. But uh, but yeah, you know I can awesome, leave it man. leave it there, and Thank you can you. you can check us out at. Uh, at you know online or anything uh, trukava.com and that's our website and you can find a lot of information and stuff there i've done a lot of podcasts with luke and other people and so just if you feel compelled thanks brother thanks for making the time i'm glad we got to sit down and share our kava <laughs> it's the best thanks, man. i need to have one of these on every podcast i yeah. do the only thing is i drink it so fast then i have to take a pee break in the middle as i did today <laughs> yeah. but no one knows that hopefully because we probably yeah. edited it out but yeah. no seriously they man. do now great to see you bro <laughs> they do now great to see you uh keep yes, up the good man. work and thanks for coming by to have a chat with me and thanks for letting me have these conversations <laughs> i can't have these conversations on every podcast but always can with you you man. are welcome here, love you friend. man you too brother mm -hmm.